it's actually a nasty beast, but this is this is a very natural object and very simple. And what you will find is that it is the area of this divided by 4G Newton, and this is reminiscent of Bacon, Baconstein walking uh, in their entropy for a black hole. So, so this is striking. This is very sweet, um, and um, you can also you can you can not just is this um, similar as in the formula to the Baconstein walking. Uh, entropy, but you can also think of sort of the information of so if you think of a black hole, uh, there is information which is not accessible from A. So the event horizon shields, shrouds the information within B. And here you can think of this this minimal surface. You can think also as of it as an event horizon which shrouds the information behind um, behind the surface. So it's it's like an event horizon. Um, all right, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to look at the uncertainty contained in A alone. So that's that's um, one way of motivating entanglement when you're coming from gravity. Okay. Um, so more when 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 venturing away from gravity, the more pedestrian way of talking about entanglement, or the, the simpler way, is just to take um, I'm going to always talk about one plus one dimensional systems. Um, so you're going to take uh, a spatial slice, so that's just an interval. Um, and you're going to partition that into a region B and a region, and a region A. And now you want to associate Hilbert spaces, uh, Hilbert space A and Hilbert space B. Okay, so um, in order to compute the entanglement of A with B, one thing you do is first you look for a density matrix which is associated only with A. This is done by tracing away everything, by taking a density matrix for a state which lives on the spatial slice, tracing away everything on B, and then computing the phenomenon entropy. Um, so that's, that's the, standard, the standard procedure, and as you see, so this carries a logarithm, uh, in principle something pretty nasty, at least in field theory. Like for two by two matrices, you can still do it, and you'll have fun. But uh, once you venture away from that, it's going to be more nasty. All right. So the Rennie entropies um, get by. So these are a generalization of the Neumann entropies, where you don't need to compute any logarithm, and you can find the Neumann entropy as a as a limit when n goes to one. So it's preferable to look at these guys. So that's so when we typically study entanglement, instead of studying this directly, we study first the Rennie entropies, uh, and and if we're interested in Neumann entropy, we just take the limit and goes to one. But the Rennie entropy is more general, right? Yes, it's more. The Rennie entropy is indeed more general. It's it's not additive law. No, no, no. It's not. It's not. It's not like a conventional entropy. Um. Thank you. Good comment. All right, so um, how would you compute in field theory? How would you go about computing these Rennie entropies? So uh, you have, what you have is you have a trace over an nth power of the density matrix. Um, and it turns out that each density matrix can be associated with, with a world sheet, with a two-dimensional manifold of the system that you're living on. And now you're going to cut out, so you're going to have this interval A. The rest is the interval B, which is drawn, and uh, this is going to be seen as sort of a slit, and you're going to connect n such copies along this slit, and the trace just means that you connect the, the last with the first of these copies. Um, long story short, the way you compute this is by the insertion of a twist field, which basically mimics this geometry. So for a single interval, what you would do is you would compute for in order to, to obtain any entropies, you would compute the two-point function of a twist field. On this two point, this, this, this is fixed completely in CFT. So in CFT, two-point functions have no dynamical information, and all that you need to know is the conformal dimension of these twist fields, and you find that it really just depends on n and the central charge. Now you plug that into your Rennie functional and you find an expression. So this this here is the is the famous result by Cardi and Calabrese here in 2004 or uh, two maybe I should check. Anyway, so you you find this result which is universal. So it doesn't have any dependence 
on the CFT besides the central charge. And um, this was striking, this was, this was interesting, this is part of why this result was so remarkable, because it was also uh, found in experimental observations and simulations, and so on, it was found that this uh, fits rather well. Um, but it was also a bit disappointing, in the sense that it is indeed universal, and you can't really distinguish a particular CFT from another one. For instance, if you're looking at a free boson theory, uh, free boson theories have a modulus, which is a compactification radius, and it, this doesn't show up in this formula. So that's that's disappointing. And how should it? How should it? If you look at this two-point function, it's like I said, it's completely fixed by conformal symmetry. It doesn't really have much data on this on the CFT. Um, so it was found more recently, well, not super duper recently, but more recently than this, that there are high-order terms, which is called the, the, the entanglement spectrum, which indeed cover information of the CFT that, or theory more generally, not the CFT necessarily, that, that you're studying. So what we want to do um, here in this, in this talk, we want to talk a bit about these higher line orders and see what data they cover, uh, that they contain from the CFT that we're studying. Uh, I want to point out just uh, that in, in ADS-CFT, you do get this result. Uh, you, go, you get only the univer universal piece uh, because this minimal geodesic for the butagenic prescription is also fixed completely by symmetry, just as a two-point function would be. Uh, because ADS-3 has isometries which are conformal symmetry and uh, that's it. Okay, so this is this is the aim for this talk. So far, so far, so good for the motivation. What we want to study here is the entanglement these line orders. So up until here, if there are any questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, yes. Sorry, the ESCFD does not contain any information on the entanglement spectrum, right? I mean, we had so far, like the the, the prescription Mergenta-Genadi does not. Like, but yeah, uh, some correction to that. Or that exist or, uh, uh, in principle, th there should, there should. I mean, that that's that's an interesting question. I don't think anybody has addressed that. Um, the the, the uh, uh, dual gravity that gives this. What dual gravity is used for uh, the uh, for that geometry? That's the point. Sort of, um, as you've got this uh, d this divided by four g newton. So there's a dual gravity. Yeah, there is a dual gravity theory. You, you can. You can do Newton is doesn't have enough other meaning in two dimensions. But you're in, sorry, you're in two, you're in three dimensions. Well, when you would okay, so the honest way of doing it, right? First of all, yes, you're in three dimensions. You you would get uh, Einstein Hilbert zone uh, with a negative cosmological constant. But typically, if you want to do ADS CFT, there there are two ways of doing it. Number one is you do bottom up, and you really just study a three dimensional system, and uh, then. G Newton is the central charge, essentially the central charge uh, time and the, and the ADS radius. So there is this famous formula by Brown, Brown and Hino, which tells you that the central charge is, uh, I keep forgetting if it was ADS radius over G Newton or the other way around. Um, but the point is, it really only covers that information too. Now there is another way, uh, if you come from string theory, then you look at a 10 dimensional theory, where ADS3 is only a submanifold. You have ADS3 typically times S3 times T4, but you can also have other like time ADS3 times the six manifold. And then you, you have more, more leverage on what theory you're looking at there. But from what I've seen, people also only study like the leading order. They just compute the geodesic. Um, you, you can go and you can look at the higher derivative with that, the R squared corrections. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting to see. Yeah. What I'm going to, yeah, the nature of make from from a gravity perspective. Yes. What, what I'm going to argue here is that there are more more as more there's more to this um, to the setup that, that that I've just explained. There are a few there there is a little hiccup that we'll run into because there is a field theory description. I'm going to explain that in a second. So there is more structure that we need to add, and uh, and at the end we can actually discuss it if we can do this like. Come back to your question, to, to your argument, how how to naturally uh, get a get a handle on this entanglement spectrum. Um, cool. All right. So then.
than this carry on. So now for the hiccup. Um, so entanglement is, is typically studied, or when, when people like when we learn entanglement in, in quantum mechanics and so on, what we do is we study, study spin chains where we have finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and those are the density matrix of finite dimensional objects. And another thing that is particularly clear when you study the spin chain is how to partition a chain into a region A into a region B simply because a chain just has a Hilbert space. Um, which is C for one spin, C for another, C for another, C for another, like just as many times C, C to the n tensor power uh, for each spin. Now it's very clear how to partition this into a region A and to a region B. Okay, so we want to repeat this for a quantum field theory. Now we run into a fundamental issue. And the issue is that the field is a distribution, it wants to be smeared over something. And I can't simply cut space and tell the field to be fine with it. I need to tell the field, I need to indicate to the field how to behave at the cut. So one way of doing that is to impose boundary conditions. So I need to, and at, at, the, at, the, at the boundaries of the interval, I will have to indicate to the field how to behave. Um, why, is this, why is this reasonable? Um, so it was so there was a simulation done by a guy called Leuchty. He's a condensed matter physicist um, in 2013, and what he looked at was the balls of Hubbard chain. That's for like high energy physicists. That's just free bosons uh, energies, and he was interested in the entanglement spectrum. Um, entanglement spectrum. I should maybe just say what that more generally is for him. These were just the eigenvalues of a reduced density matrix. So he had access to a reduced density matrix um, from the spin chain itself by numerics, and then he went to low energies and looked at the eigenvalues of this density matrix. And what he expected to find was, uh, because the boson hubbard chain has a free boson realization, he expected to find a free boson CFT. And indeed, he did find a free boson CFT, but something was off. And what was off were the degeneracies. So typically, in a free boson CFT, you have left movers and right movers. This gives you a certain number of degeneracies. But what you would only find is just a chiral CFT. So not the degeneracies of left movers and right movers, but just a single one. And it turns out that you can make way with this uh, by thinking of this spectrum as that of a BCFT. So when you have conformal boundary conditions on a CFT, what happens is that you couple left movers to right movers. So they're no longer independent. And then the spe spectrum sort of the degeneracies truncate. You only get um, you only get the degeneracies for a chiral CFT essentially. And um, it turns out that this is the correct way of thinking about it. So I'm gonna argue in a minute. So here, just the comment. So this, this is one of the simulations that he saw. He saw here this, this parabola that is just um, this is just the hallmark of the free boson, it's just the quadratic. Uh, relation. So this this is the entanglement spectrum, and here this is essentially your one charge, um, and in the free boson CFT the energies go as a square of a U1 charge, uh, and you see that here the degeneracies, um, well actually here up here when you go to higher energies you see that there are three dots for instance in the CFT they typically want to lie on top of each other but what you found was that they're starting to move away down here they're all um, behaving properly, so to speak. So you just, can just can you explain the transmit spectrum? Because I, uh, I don't understand what the entanglement spectrum looks like. Okay, so so here he has these. Uh, he has your, expl your explanation uh, in terms of the reduced density matrix, we know what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to trace over eight and nine space age, where eight and nine is uh, uh, Hubbard, uh, this was Hubbard model. Right. He takes that trace on his, his one and he gets. This reduced density matrix, he can look at the eigenvalues of that. Yes. So that he can yes. compute trace row log row. Yes. But so not necessarily trace row log row, he's just going to compute the eigenvalues of that density yeah, matrix. Yeah, but he would say, once I've computed the eigenvalues, you can easily compute trace row log row. Yeah, yeah, you can do that, but it's not easy. That's not what. What do you mean by the, on your graph here? What are you showing us with respect the, to that? Right, this, this is not trace row log row, this is just. 
This is just the eigenspectrum of the density matrix, and you see that basically it has it has eigenvalues. It has it has your one charge sort of like here you see it has all oh right. So this has two components. It has energies. These are the eigenvalues of the density, and they're going to be also there is another another quantum number in the system that's a U1 charge essentially, um, and uh, and that that's going to give them these these uh, these degeneracies so to speak. So you see. What is the U1 charge in the Hubbard module? Um, in the Hubbard mo in the free boson CFT, it's really just the. What do you mean in the Hubbard module? That is part of this thing. I only want to take it to understand. Oh, I never studied that in Hubbard model that much, so I, I wouldn't. So I guess it's it's the number operator, like. Um, but to be honest, I really don't get the number. I don't know. No. Um, yeah, but, but so in principle for. I mean, the number operator. Yes. Yeah, well, for him, yeah, it's the number operator. Except the minus doesn't make it. Um, yeah, it's it's more like it's it's for me it's a U1 charge. Uh, the that's true, like the minus one doesn't make much sense. But for me it's it's it, in the CFT it's going to be a U1 charge. Um, that basically tells you that you so the, the free boson has an action which is del phi squared, and you can you can translate that phi by a constant, and that's going to give you symmetry. Right? So del phi, where when yeah, phi goes to yeah, I, I see it exactly what it is in the in the uh, in yeah. that one, but I don't. Since this is the this is numerics on the uh, on the lattice, uh, yes. On the so yeah, that's what I wanted to understand that they are. If you want, I can look it up and come back to you. Yeah, it's not going to be a lot of important for for the. It must be something to do with it. I mean, you have the Z-N symmetry in the Hubbard model. Is that what it is? Or the Z-N symmetry for? Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. no, no, no. I mean, we'll see. If we don't yeah, see no, this is the. I guess maybe it's a total partial number is conserved. So number in subsystem A plus number in subsystem B is conserved. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Delta yeah. NA can go negative. Yeah, yeah, it's a difference. Yeah, it's yeah, strong. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so where was I? So then, then you see that here the degeneracy, they sort of move apart. And that just means that, um, so this is a CFT. You're trying to fit a speed CFT spectrum to a lattice, and the more you move up in energy, at some point it's going to break down. So th this is to be expected. So the CFT prediction is not. It's not going to be reliable, unfortunately, for all of the, for all. But but you do see that it's it's a rather good fit, even to um, like not just the lowest energy level. The lowest energy level is what is responsible for the for the universal piece. And then there are some other energy levels which are going to be the low lying additions to the entanglement spectrum. So um, so we expect the BC a, a boundary condition to be. Um, to be useful, to be added to this. So now, let's make this a bit more formal. Oh, no, that's not my cursor. Okay, so um, this was formalized in, two, so the, the simulation was in 13, and two years later there were Tachikawa and Omori, and uh, Cardi and Tony in 16, who thought a bit more abstractly about this and tried to formalize this. Um, uh, so what they said is, you can try to pick a, so, so you're interested, so the, the, the problematic points are these endpoints here. And what you should do is you should pick a locally complete set of commuting observables. This is typically just a, um, basically you want to do quantum mechanics here on, on the, in the vicinity of the edges. So you pick something which is locally commuting to label eigenstates, eigenspaces. And then, well, what you do is you just project onto their eigenspaces. And what you should do, like formally, to do this properly, you need to regularize. And um, so, what he says, or what they say, is you take the interval ends and you excise small disks here. Uh, these small disks are going to have some radius, which is basically UV cutoff. Um, and um, on these disks, what you're going to do is you're going to impose boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions are the ones that that were observed in the simulation just before. Um, and um, mathematically, what you find then is that Hilbert space, it does not really, it does, it's not equal to HA times HB, 
but this is sort of a mapping between Hilbert space and then you, you associate a factorized Hilbert space HA which which uh, knows about boundary conditions that you imposed and a, a Hilbert space HP. So this is how in field theory um, the, there's the statement um, in the algebraic PFT community that you, you can't really take H and split it into uh, a, fact, a, a product Hilbert space for associated with regions, but what you can do is you can do a mapping. And that's going to give you a degree of freedom on top of what you originally had, and that's this boundary condition. You, you may choose boundary conditions here. Um, all right, so that's what we're going to work with. Um, all right, uh, for instance, uh, for U1 uh, symmetric CFT, that's a free boson. Uh, there are, I mean, introducing boundary conditions is something very, very violent. It, it, may, it may mess with all of the symmetries in the system. But you may also pick boundary conditions which are very special. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick boundary conditions which are conformally symmetric. That means that the, the, the energy momentum tensor, the left mover and the right mover, are going to be coupled identically to each other. So they're going to, on the boundary, on these disks, um, they're going to be the same. And for the U1 current in your system, uh, you, you have a little bit more leeway, a little bit more freedom. Um, and that's here in this case, it's a sign. You have a plus minus. And that's going to be either in, like in layman's terms, it's going to be a DHDA boundary condition or a Neumann boundary condition. And um, one thing that you can do is using using these, these boundary conditions, you can actually derive a Hamiltonian, just like in boundary conformal field theory, you, you can derive a Hamiltonian which acts on the boundary. Here you have a Hamiltonian um, which acts in the subsystem A, and it so happens to be that this looks exactly. So you just follow a boundary conformal field theory recipe, um, and you will recover uh, something which is called the, the entanglement Hamiltonian or modular Hamiltonian. So this this is exactly what you will find. You can do the same thing for a U1 charge. Um, and these are now your, your locally commuting observables, and you're going to pick them. So these are going to basically code the Hilbert space HA. You're going to you're going to have a Hilbert space HA, which are eigenstates of these two operators. So that's what you want to do. Okay, and so now now we're equipped to actually look at the entanglement spectrum. All right. So just can you can you explain why can you motivate that KA a little bit better? Why is it quadratic? X squared. In X squared. Yes. Oh, yeah. So the, there's there's a. It's it's indeed it's, it's looks it looks like a, it's it's an energy density which is not homogeneously distributed, and it turns out that that's what it should be in a sense. So when you study, so what this is going to be is it's going to be the logarithm of the reduced density matrix. You don't expect this to be a homogeneously distributed energy. Like if you if you were to write. The idea is, is a little bit as follows, heuristically. Um, even if I give you a pure, pure state to begin with, after tracing, the state is no longer pure but mixed. So you're going to associate a quote unquote thermal ensemble to this to this density matrix, and this is the Hamiltonian that does that. But now this thermal ensemble has no business generically having a, a uniform temperature distribution. And so it's going to be something. And this particular value here depends on, this is not a generic, this is for a single interval, but you could have chosen, um, this is a single interval for a, for a CFT on a plane, but you could have chosen a CFT on a cylinder, then this would have looked a bit differently. You could have chosen a CFT on a thermal state, then this would have looked also a bit differently. And this X squared basically, it really comes from um, taking this interval, and mapping it onto an annulus. So this mapping, this is a conformal mapping, is going to have a particular shape, and that's where this x squared is coming from. I can I can show I can show you a mapping after after the talk. Um, it's not really conformal. There is this dictated that it has to be a dimension less quantity here. Once you map to visually, or a dimension one quantity as well as x. Uh, I may have made a missed the square here. It could be. It could be that the that I that I didn't type type this up right. So I, I will I will put my hand uh, like I I wouldn't bet on this particular expression, but the the form that it goes with x squared is definitely correct. 
Like minus x squared is fine, but the, it may, there may be a square here that I messed up. I'm wondering what should be an x squared rather than some other exponent. And unless there's some principle that's dictating this, the function there. Yeah, there, there is a, the principle is really like take, taking this and mapping it to an annulus. Uh, like physically, why should it be an x squared? Um, yeah, let me think about that. You said it's quadruple, right? Then this thing is essentially what it what it's going to look like. It's it's like a whole as an x squared. It looks like a Coulomb interaction. Yeah, like they, so. It looks like a Coulomb interaction, but I don't quite recall if that thing looks quadratic in two dimensions. Uh, uh, Coulomb is not good in two dimensions. Yeah, exactly. The mapping is going to be that. Convention, it's it's minus one. It's it's growing linearly. In zero dimensions, it's squared. But okay. No zero dimensions. I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you the mapping after, and then you'll then maybe you can make some like for why it's particularly x squared. Um, you can find an answer to that. Um, okay. So. Uh, Right, so what, what you want to do is now you're interested you're interested in like in the beginning you were interested in replica geometries. Uh, so you're gonna you're gonna take this this picture here, you're gonna replicate it n times, it's gonna give you some geometry. Uh, you're gonna trace over B, um, and the rest of that can be mapped into an annulus. So this is a procedure that that you can just run through, and the point is that um, there's Reference to this annulus, which is now uh, n times the original circumference. If the original circumference was 2 pi, then the replication of with n gives you a factor of n, and you're going to have a width to this thing, and this width um, is going to encode on here. It is it's going to be basically the logarithm of the original size of the interval a, and um, there's an there's a UV cutoff encoded in this width. So if the if the UV cutoff at the end of the day you want to have that thing small, so this W is going to blow up, um, and uh, and that's going to return sort of the the Cardi Calabrese results that, that you're all familiar with, um, or I'm not I'm sure if you're all familiar with that. Anyway, so if if you started out with the vacuum state on the C of T, then using this this, um, this procedure, you can actually write down the reduced density matrix um, for, for the interval A. If it's just a single interval, I should stress that. If you go to two intervals, this thing is uh, unfortunately not as useful anymore, at least not as of today. So um, what you have is you really just have uh, Q, which is, well, one way of thinking about it is that um, this, this reduced density matrix will generate rotations around the disks, and that basically what this is on the annulus, it's just following these, these, uh, the circumference of the annulus, and in CFT, there's a natural operator which does that, and that's the zero zero sort of mode. That's this guy. And in order to get um, trace of rho being one, to normalize this correctly, you need to divide by a partition function, and this partition function is just the counts the number of states or all the states running in this loop, and uh, it obviously knows about boundary conditions A and it knows about boundary conditions B. That's why it carries the stable, but it's not going to be terribly important like the alpha beta here. Okay, so um, so that that's actually very fancy. So you actually have access to the reduced density matrix in CFT bingo. Uh, this is something that that. You have now in this formalism by, by Tachikawa and Cardi, Tony, and Tomori. And Cardi and Calabrese weren't able to really, really give you this expression. Implicitly, they use it um, if you compare their construction to this, to this boundary conformal field theory construction. They're using that, but uh, they're um, oblivious of it. Okay. So here there are some details. Um, so this slide is not terribly important, but just for experts. So, uh, so the partition function in a CFT or in a boundary conformal field theory typically is just so you have a set of conformal primaries. These are the ground states, and you have a number of descendants. And um, 
basically in the limits where the UV cutoff goes to zero. So this uh, this epsilon that I had just a minute ago here, this epsilon when this goes to zero, such a partition function is going to be dominated by one primary field, and that's the one with lowest conformal dimension. Typically, that's going to be um, with conformal like the identity field that has conformal dimension zero, but it can also have some higher conformal dimension. Um, and then there's going to be some some multiplicative factor, which is which is called the boundary entropy, um, and that's going to show up here and there in the construction that I'm going to show. But the point really is just the partition function is dominated by one field, and there is some degeneracy associated with that. Okay, um, so when you take that, you can stuff that into the Rennie entropies. Uh, you evaluate the standard expression. This is not so important. What you get is you get one piece which comes from the lightest primary. That's this guy. And basically, what it is, it's this. It's it's an expression with really which which is the cardi calabrese entanglement entropy, uh, or Rennie entropy, more generally. Uh, what you find here is you have, a, you have a minor correction, like for cardi calabrese this was zero, but when you have, um, you can have, a, like I said, like I said, the lightest primary need not be of conformal dimension zero, it can have some other conformal dimension, then you have a correction. And another piece that arises is to zero order this, this boundary entropy here, this, uh, this piece. So now you may ask, um, uh, so here there's an epsilon, and that's a regularization. So I should be able to fool around, like rescale the, the, the epsilon. And, um, and in this way, I should be able to absorb this, this boundary entropy. Um, yes, you may do that. You may do that for a particular n, say n equals 1 or n equals 2. But then this rescaling will show up in, in a characteristic way for a different n. So in this way, you'll always be able to tell this, this boundary entropy term um, a way that you will always be able to, to, to extract that thing. In that sense, it's going to be physical. So it's not, it's not, it cannot be rescaled away by fooling around with the regularization parameter. Um, so how did you get uh, epsilon into you have two formula there? One of them doesn't have epsilon, and the other one does. So right, so this, this piece here does not have epsilon. The left hand side with the S in alpha beta doesn't have epsilon in it. Yes. Uh, here, here there is this, oh I forgot to, to stress. So so there is going to be this Q here. And this Q is uh, I had that on the on the other slide. Here Q has this W. And W has the epsilon, so it's really repackaged there in many ways. So, yes, good, good that you pointed out. But so yeah, you see that it, it shows up. It shows up in this Q. What you want to do? Q is not a good expansion variable. So what you're going to do is you're going to use this. Um, you're going to go to Q twiddle. That's a modular S transformation. That is a good expansion variable because when, when epsilon goes to zero, that thing shrinks. Um, right. So that so gives sorry, you. How is Q twiddle related? To um, Q, Q twiddle is e to the minus 2w, and Q, and Q was, uh, uh, it goes with, so the exponent goes with the inverse of w. So basically, so you've got two, two, Q to minus 1 over Q or something. Right, that, that's, that's, that implies the automatic, but it's tau to minus 1 over tau. Yes, right, tau to minus 1 over tau. Um, that, that, will, that will bring you to this. And tau is, is uh, basically something like, well, here you see it, it's like i um, to, it's i pi over w. Okay. And then when tau goes to 1 over tau, the w goes from 1 over w to, uh, to w. Right? So that's how it goes. Why are you allowed to do that? Because uh, that switches the two cycles on your circle. Your tar and your cylinder here. Ah, uh, right. You don't have a torus. Then, so. Right, it's not going to be. Um, so this, this is a feature of BCFT, right? So this thing, this thing, is no longer going to be modular invariant. It's going to be like modular invariant is from the torus. The annulus is not, right? Yes. Um, but you can still like each of these characters can still be rephrased as so. What you would do is you just expand it in terms like uh, you do the 
the modular S transformation, and then you pick up, and so the, the modular S function is in here actually. Um, this is the, uh, let me hide it, this should be S, the, the, this, the S omega component with, uh, with the vacuum. Um, so, so you can still view these functions as modular functions, so you're allowed to do a modular S transformation. But the physics is not, it's not going to be... They will transform. Yeah, they will transform, that's it, that's the point. So depending, like on the torus, no matter what frame I pick, the expression is going to look the same. And on the annulus, if I pick a different frame... Sorry, yeah. the, the, the only influence of the boundary conditions, you, it looks like you recorded it in, our, in the ends here, which are just coefficients. Yes, right, so the... the and those are, those are just coefficients, they are not... Uh, Correct, what the boundary conditions are going to do. So at the end of the day, it's this. So I give you a Hilbert space, which falls into representations of a symmetry algebra. Let it be zero, right? So that, that's a statement independent of boundary conditions. Now what the boundary conditions are going to do is they're going to select for you which representations are allowed to play in the game. So which representations appear in the Hilbert space at all. So these things are multiplicities, um, and they're basically, for instance, uh, let me give you an example. Yeah, no, no, they, they understand them. Yeah. Okay. They, 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 you, you're only allowed uh, uh, Neumann and uh, Dirichlet because the other, any other boundary conditions are scale associated with them. So you're only allowed about those ones, and you're allowed to get found in the other Right, okay. That, that means so the the like for instance, um, and then only been allowed to just uh, add characters. Plus yeah, the characters. Character. So Neumann these day, of course, for free theories, yes, that that's a valid statement. But when you go to more abstract things, you can just uh, no, it's not. It's a statement we can follow in there. It's not. It's nothing to do with free theories. Right, right. It's a statement. Exactly. That's that's the point. That's it's a statement of conformal appearance. In the end, at the end of the day, the Hilbert space, uh, which I didn't have have full glory here. Is going to fall like this statement. What it is, it really is just a statement that the Hilbert space falls into representations of the symmetry algebra. That that's a statement, even independent of conformal symmetry. That's just a statement on the Hilbert on the symmetry acting on a vector space um, in a natural way. Right? It's represented naturally. Okay. Um, okay. Long story short, there the Grenier entropies have two pieces. Number one, the light is primary, and then the scale factor, which gives you a uh, which gives you an additional piece. So now we've already made a bit of progress over the result by Cardi Um That's this, this small piece here. Um, and in principle, you can also look at higher order terms. I'm not going to do this here uh, for the moment. Like I said in the simulation before, there, there are some higher lying terms in, um, in the spectrum. Which, which also agreed pretty, pretty like in the, C, the CFT prediction agreed pretty well with the simulation of the, of the bose hopper chain. Okay, um, so for now that, that was enough of general integrals. Now I want to talk about symmetry resolution. So um, symmetry resolution now really is just, uh, you, you add another feature. What if the system that you're, that you're studying, the subsystem that you're studying, carries more symmetry than say just zero zero? So what do you do? Um, can you extract information on these on these symmetry sectors? And in essence, it's like what uh, what you said before. Like you have a you one charge, you fix a state. You have a number operator that 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 number operator. So say you have two particles in 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 this state, and now you pick a region, and that region may have one particle, and the other one has one particle, and then there's fluctuations between the two. Okay. So that's what we're going to look at now. Um, but before we go there, uh, let me just remind you of, of a bit, I guess like here it's, it's a bit redundant to do so, um, but uh, how do we think of symmetry? So I want to think of symmetry as an organizing principle. Suppose I, I'm given a vector space, so an Hilbert space HA, for instance, which is given by these geometric shapes. So you have triangles, circles, squares, and you may even have different colors, then what you may do is you can organize this thing either by color, um, you can organize it by shape, or if you're really, really good, 
So if your symmetry algebra is really large, you can do both at the same time. So these are just different examples of representations. Right? Um, how do you how do you structure this Hilbert space? And now we're going to ask: Can we structure Hilbert spaces in um, in a, in a mathematical way? And yes, of course we can. So suppose we have a symmetry. So you, you're having a symmetry operator uh, on the subregion, which commutes with the density matrix. Then this what it implies is that this density matrix is going to fall into into a block diagonal form. That's, that's just linear algebra, and each of these blocks is going to correspond to one eigenvalue of this of this uh, charge operator. And what you're interested in is you want to know um, what is the information count in one of these individual charge operators. And that's way, the way to compute this. You you compute the Rennie entropy of one of these blocks, and that's going to be I'm going to call this row A of Q. Um, and uh, well, one way that why, why should you care? Like, for instance, condensed matter physicists care because they um, they diagnose symmetry protected topological states with that. But that's one one thing. Um, and uh, certainly there are more applications than that. Okay, so this is an, it's a bit of detail. So again, it's not super duper important that you catch all the details here. But suppose you have such a block decomposition of row A. So it, it falls into some subsectors. There's some probability associated with the subsector for some charge Q, and you can write down a projector for that. Then just as in quantum mechanics, the probability of lying in a state or in a sector Q is just given by the trace of the density matrix and the projector onto that block, onto that sector. And as in Rennie, as in Rennie business, you have some, you're interested in writing down something like rho to the n, but now you're going to insert some projection, projection operator. The reason you do that is just just um, uh, some some uh, algebraic stuff. So when, when you're interested in the reduced density matrix, uh, sorry, the, the Rennie entropies, then what you do is you do the same functional but with row A of Q, so for one particular chart sector, and then you find these these guys which which replace the standard um, partition functions. In the Rennie functional. Anyway, so uh, this has been computed in 2013 and uh, excuse me, 2018. Uh, so such ideas have been around 2013 in holography, and here in this this particular calculation was done in 18. Uh, what you find is you find um, a result. So you evaluate this. This is for a free boson for U1 symmetric CFT. Um, you find an expression. Which looks so. This looks like the Cardi Calabresi term, but there's no central charge here. I should say though that the central charge is one in this system, so you, you would also see it, but actually it's not there. Um, you get another piece. This is double. So remember that W is a logarithm of A. So this is doubly logarithmic, and this piece. Let's just not think about it. Um, so there's a surprise here. And what's the surprise? So so I argued that. Or I said that this would tell me the information count stored in a sector of charge Q. Right? So you would expect some Q dependence down here. And uh, you will be disappointed. So there is no Q dependence. So what's going on? So this, this, was, this was a puzzle. Um, so this was called equipartition of entanglement. So there was no Q dependence. This was part of 18. And um, you, you may ask, well, is there Q dependence? Further here, and I'm going to answer that question in a minute uh, by using the boundary control view theory stuff that I talked about before. So this this was computed without any boundary conditions and so on. Um, all right. So I guess the first, not I guess. So the, the one signature that we, that people saw was this W logarithmic term uh, and no charge dependence. So in order to explain the charge dependence. So you would expect maybe it's, it's at the higher orders. Uh, but in order to explain that, I'm going to go back to the boundary conditions and actually tell you what the result is in full glory. Um, so let's take a look. So the theory that they looked at was just a, a U1 CFT. So that means you have a charge Q. Um, how, does, how do you work with U1 CFTs? You have Fox spaces. So you have a charge Q, like a ground state which, which codes the charge Q. That's, that's a conformal primary. 
Um, and you have a bunch of POC modes which you can have act on that ground state. Um, so that, that's just the POC space. And then you want to impose boundary conditions at the disks. And here you have two choices, which is just, just a plus minus. There, you don't need to know particularly what, what the, so what it's going to do, it's going to select um, charges Q that are allowed in the partition functions, just that's going to select like representations which are in the in the Hilbert space. Um, I didn't, it's not so important which charges these are, the result is going to be, it's going to work uh, independently of, of, of these charges. And it's not going to be independent of the charges, but it's going to be working analogously for a plus or minus sign. That's the trick statement. So you get two, you get, um, you get, uh, excuse me, so in order to, to study this, you need to know about the conformal characters. So they, they basically have two contributions. Number one is, um, so there's, there's a charge Q. This, this is the ground state, and this is coded basically in this, in this expo in the exponent here. They have Q squared, that's conformal weight. Um, and you have an eta, the thing just counts descendants. So how can you, the possible combinations that you have of creating descendants in a Fox space. So there is no, um, it, it really is just a counting thing. So the, the particular expression is not so important. And um, then what you're instructed to compute are these, these partition functions, which are these projected density matrices elevated to the power n and then traced over. Um, and what you find is that what this thing does, if I just pick a charge q, it goes into this partition function and just selects a character for charge q. That's it. And then, of course, this, this thing down here is just a normalization. But all that we have is like the, the projector, or is it this guy? It's just going to select one character. So that's super simple and super natural. Right? You have a Hilbert space, and you're just looking for all states of one. Like the, the sub the representations that carry one charge, that's just the character. That's the one that's counting this. All right. And if Q does not appear, so if you, if you should be so naive as to ask, so suppose this has charges, integral charges, one, two, three, four, five, and you're looking for half integral charge, like one over two, and you try to project onto that, then this thing vanishes. So, as it should. This was actually um, overlooked in the, in, the, um, in the calculations done before. So this is where, where my work starts, by the way. So um, this is just, um, uh, well, this is before my stuff starts. Okay, so then what you should do is, uh, the details are not super duper important, uh, but in order to compute these, these Rainy entropies, you were asked, we were asking about, or we were one, we were surprised by the charge independence. And here you see why the thing is charge independent for U1. It is because the characters of U1 have Q to the square. So when you take, um, so basically what, what you're instructed to do is you, you instructed to compute this ratio. And that thing is just one. Um, so the charge dependence just drops out entirely. Um, so let me just briefly tell you what, what this was. So this was just um, here. This is what I'm trying to compute. And um, one that once there's n, once there's a 1, and that basically just, and that just, just gives me this ratio. Um, so there is a 1 elevated to the power n, and then there's n times q. That's, that's just what it is. But you see that this is just, this just uh, drops out entirely. And then you can compute this thing in full glory because you have access to these data. So you can you find the, the, the known terms and you find all terms which, which extend this result. And there is no charge dependence. So the reason there is no charge dependence for U1 really is that the characters uh, look super simple. And I'm going to say a bit, so why do the characters look super simple? Um, they look super simple because there are no null vectors in these representations, but I'm going to say a bit about that in a moment. Um, okay. Uh, well, there is a bit of charge dependence here, and the charge dependence just means uh, the boundary conditions that you keep in the beginning, the H. Lehrer Neumann, indicate to you which charges are allowed in the partition function in the first place. This just boils down to the fact that if like I said, if you're looking for, if you only have integral charges, say, then um, you can't really compute this for a half integral charge. It just makes no sense. Um, 
just, just tell us that what the, uh, remind me what how did you treat the limiting goes to zero of the of zero? Uh limiting goes to zero of what? This term. I mean, you've got a one over n here, which is problematic. But you mean you're all interested in Ah uh, here this thing. And the, you know that one? That, well, that one is problematic, but this one is that one is problematic as well. How was how was that treated to get the? Uh, in, you mean, you, this is the Rene entropy, yeah? Right. This is the charge Rene entropy. Oh, you want to take the limit then goes to zero. At one, one, not zero, one. The 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 von Neumann entropy is the limit of n goes to one of the Rene entropy. Because all those cubes of it's in this two to one, is it? Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah. But so you see that this result is actually so this this neatly goes to Okay, all right, yes. Mm -hmm. But otherwise like zero is, is that problem. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um let me so so you can do it there there's more symmetry in the system which I'm just gonna because uh, I'm already running running so I'm going to skip this and uh, just go to conformal symmetry. Uh, so what what I've said before basically just hinges on the statement that, that you have a Hilbert space and you have some symmetries acting on it. So that means you have representations of that of that symmetry, and that that really is a, is a statement that that is uh, it doesn't care about you one particularly. It can be applied to any symmetry. So let's do conformal symmetry. Um, I'm only going to demand that at the, at the disks, the energy momentum tensors of the left mover and right mover agree. And then I'm going to get a partition function. So this is a famous result of like Cardi of uh, 89, um, where you get, you have um, primaries which label the, the boundary conditions. And uh, these primaries basically give you fusion rules, and these fusion rules determine which characters are allowed in, uh, by the boundary conditions. Um, all right, so you can repeat all the, the, the business as before. You can compute, uh, you have a partition function, you have a reduced density matrix, and you can now write down what these reduced density matrices are for a single block for one part. So what I'm going to look at is the charges that I'm going to look at are now going to be the conformal families themselves. So you're going to have a reduced density matrix which, which encodes all the data for one conformal family on the subregion, and um, what you're going to have is really just this thing, but like um, evaluated only on on the subspace for the conformal family. So you have n times n i times some conformal family, excuse me, n alpha beta times some conformal family i, and then that's that's this this thing. It really just acts on that subsector, and this prefactor is just like a mini partition function. For that family, um, many details. But the the point here is that it really just runs runs through analogously as before. And um, now you can compute these symmetry result entropies, and what you will find is a very general expression. It's just that if you're interested in the in the information count stored in a particular family I, which is allowed on the subregion. Uh, what you will find is some prefactor is not so important right now, but you will find a ratio of characters. Uh, and the difference in this ratio is like on top, you have Q to the N. Um, that's essentially like the annulus has a, has um, a circumference N times N times uh, one, say, or circumference N, let's just call it that. And then you compare it to um, the annulus with just one period, but elevated to the nth power. So, so that's what you essentially always do in entanglement. You, you compare partition functions with uh, some of some large manifold with uh, a smaller version of elevated to some power. And um, you will find again this this leading piece, which comes from the from. So there is a primer here, which is the lightest. That's going to give you the leading piece, and then you're going to find a piece here, uh, which comes from from this like the affleck ludwig binary term that, that we had before, but now it really just codes for one family. And this thing was is known already in the literature, and it's called topological entanglement entropy. Um, here it is indeed, if you will, you, you can you can think of it as topological here too, in the sense that there is no 
epsilon dependence on this, or no, no Q dependence, in, or differently put, no dependence on the size of the interval A. So you can wiggle the size of the interval A here, and you will get a, you will you will mess with the result. It will get smaller or bigger. But this thing will be stay will be will stay put, so it won't change. In that sense, you can think of it as topological. And um, just just for like for people who are know who know quantum dimensions, these this expression here is the modular S matrix, and this is just a, uh, a quantum dimension for some family I, and this is called the total quantum dimension. But those are just total details for now. Uh, it's not super duper. Uh, just a question about this. So usually uh -huh. the this quantity is not zero for the um, when you have anions in a two dimension, right? Two dimensional space. So yeah. One dimension is not trivial for. Uh, uh, so in, in the CFT language, so so can you fix the, exactly the quantum dimension from the CFT point of view? Yeah, yeah. The quantum dimensions are fixed. Yeah. Um, they're actually in CFT. They're defined. Well, you can depends on which CFT crowd you, you ask. But yeah. the definition I would give you is that it's it's the ratio of the character for them for the anion I yeah. divided by the character for the anion zero, okay. which is the yeah. entity. And that thing. Um, when you evaluate that for small UV cutoff, okay. we'll spit out precisely the, the, the this expression here, modular S matrix. Um, actually, no, excuse me, modular S matrix divided by another odd modular S matrix element, but that's in this, in this combination doesn't show up. Can you repeat the definition for the, of the quantum dimension? Uh, can we turn on that? Perhaps? Yeah. So. The definition that the integration should count first, what is the limit? Yeah, there's a limit. Uh, QI with Q, and then um, this thing. And in the limit, in the limit where, um, where Q, so Q is supposed to approach one from below. And in that limit, this thing is going to become uh, SI0. Divided by S zero zero, and that then I go. Yeah, that's it. Like the way you would do this is you you use that the character is um, uh, and this thing here you you only keep the leading order of that. Thing. So so Q two it will. When when you perform this limit, Q twiddle goes to zero. So you only keep the leading orders of this piece. Um, and then basically what this is going to become is uh, is S. So so now let me just let me just uh, say so suppose I'll make the lowest state is zero, like that, sorry, the, the lightest primary that's in the sum is zero, then this thing is just gonna be uh, I zero this thing. Yes. Right. So in this appears, so you see that the I appears here, so you get S I, and down here S zero zero and this character okay. just drops out. Yeah. Right? So this and, and this this expression here, if I remember correctly, uh, is what but the uh, what the condensed matter physicists use for, for quantum dimension. Yeah, good point. Uh, usually we use it for the rational CFT. Right? Yeah, this, this is, this, oh, uh, you're back. Yeah. There's an important point here. Um, this expression here uh, is only under good control for rational CFT, and like for free boson, we also have control. It's not rational, but we have control over it. But this sum um, goes over conformal families, and when it's non-rational, typically we have no clue what this is. So it's it's dangerous to, to take that out. So I should say that this this analysis that I've just done is for rational CFT. Right. Indeed. Because in holography the the central charge is very yeah. big, right? It's not uh, Yeah, then, then the question is like do do we have some model that our central charge yeah. is rational nevertheless? Uh, I'm not aware of any here. Um, but but there are, I think there are. There is a paper by Castro, um, which indicates uh, rational CFTs for ADS3 process three cross something. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. 
there are some examples. Let me just see. Uh, well, one thing you you may might want to ask is um, about the API partition. So at first we found that charge was no for a one CFT. We found that uh, that independent of the charge, all the ready entropies for charge sector look the same. And now here you you already have a difference. Um, like you, you you have this expression here, which is the same, but the second term may may very well depend on the on the conformal family. And then uh, you may actually ask, when is this still a partition? Like when when are these the same? And I just worked out a criterion. You can check this criterion. There's an, there's an example. But the point is that is finally it's this um, the quantum dimensions in essence what we just did the gymnastics now I can actually give you the following comment basically what it is is it's the size of a conformal family asymptotically like in the limit um, where q goes to one that's what I'm going to call asymptotic uh, then you can really write down a size if you I'm not sure how visible this is from back there but but you see that that a character is just like how many states are in one family and you compare that to to the identity. So it really just tells you how big is the family I compares it to family zero. Um, and uh, basically when they have the same size, they have the same amount of information. That, that, that's that mathematically at writing at the statement is, is a bit more intricate, but I mean you would have expected this, right? Entropy counts states. So you just see like which how many states are there. So that's it. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go over that example. So how can you change the size of a family? Um, and then you do that, for instance, uh, by, by adding null vectors. So I, so far I always discuss the, the case where you have this limit q, the epsilon goes to zero. But actually you don't need to do that because you have an expression which is exact. Um, so let's just think about the exact expression. And then you just compare characters for different families, and you ask like, when when is this the same? What well, you have to compare this ratio for different families, and um, then let's just look at a character. When can a character be have a unique fingerprint? Say, um, well, uh, in CFT it's this: you you have a family I, and at some point there's going to be null vectors. So there are going to be subspaces in that in that representation, which have to be thrown out. And they are going to be like a unique fingerprint. And basically, all that you have to do then in order to compare information count for such families is just compare characters and their null vector structure. And then you can actually look at equipartition partition uh, to any order, um, independent of, of a UV cutoff. Uh, so you can do this for minimal models, there the characters look terrible. Um, and you if you compare to different families, you won't ever get. They won't ever look the same. It's not a surprise. Um, for free boson, for free boson, there is a Neumann DHD boundary condition. So you, you take a Neumann boundary condition on one disk and a DHD boundary condition on the other disk. And um, it turns out that these things all have virazoral characters. So they're, it's a CFT, but none of them have, has a null vector. So independent, so you can ask, uh, for two different conformal dimensions, you can ask what is the information count. They're all going to look the same because they have no null vectors. They, they just look identical. Um, and uh, that's what I call it, Verma, because it's just a Verma module. There are no null no, no, no vectors. And um, finally, there is there is a that's probably the last statement I'm going to make. Uh, so suppose you only have unitary conformal families in your Hilbert space. Now we're going to talk a bit about central charge bigger than one, um, then for central charge bigger than one, there's only one representation in a unitary CFT, which has a null vector, and that's the vacuum. And it has a very, very simple null vector, which just sits at n equals one, and it's just uh, L minus one acting on the vacuum, that's the null vector. And then you can evaluate the characters, who's going to have this prefactor one minus q to the n. Um, so it's going to have some some character. It's going to look in a particular way, and for all other representations, there's going to be no null vector. They're all going to look the same. So from the point of view of Verazoro, for a holographic CFT, for instance, which operates at large central charge, 
there is a favorite child, and that's the vacuum. But we knew there was a favorite child, but now you also know it from a formation perspective. Um, you see that, for instance, here, this, this SN verma, that's really just the same. It's just the fact that all representations look the same, except, except for, um, for the vacuum. Um, and here, there's just, uh, this is just the, the multiplicity, but uh, let's just think of this as one. So, if you have a subregion where there is no identity module, then all the representations look the same. So, this is just from a CFT perspective, and I wonder if one can do this for, uh, like, look at this holographic. Anyhow, so that's, that's uh, let me just wrap up. Um, so, what have I done? Uh, well, I've introduced these BCFT techniques to give you some insight into the entanglement spectrum. Those are the contributions of entanglement which go beyond the universal piece of Cardiff and Um I talked a bit about how you get topological entanglement entropy uh, and how you compare that, and I briefly I did that. Um, I talked about the null vectors, how you should study null vectors. Like from this perspective of the null vectors for U1, there are no null vectors, so they all look the same, right? so you always get the Verma module essentially contribution. And uh, Verozor has a favorite charge for central charges bigger than one. Um, and one thing that I didn't talk about is that you can also resolve the, the boundary entropy, but uh, let's not do that now. Um, so stuff that you may want to do in the future. Um, talk about ADS-CFT. Like, uh, I said, I said it many things, but none of these things have been observed in ADS-CFT. Only like the leading piece, the you take an eye prescription, you see the leading piece, but all the others um, don't are, are, are not are not addressed. And one thing that I, I personally find interesting is that one can try to do this in stringy regime. So there's this uh, tensionless ADCFT by Eva Gabadi and Kobak Kumar, uh, which is on a remarkable control as as world chief theories. And one can try to just run this BCFT protocol in that setup. It's going to be nasty because the theory has many, many, many components, but in principle, with infinite effort, it should be cool. Um, then, uh, what about bulk and boundary RG flows? Like, what if I have, now I looked at the, at the, at the um, I put the state in to begin with, which was the vacuum, right? Um, and before tracing out, then I traced out, and I looked at entitlement of within the vacuum itself. Now, what happens, one thing that you may ask, what happens if I have that vacuum or that CFT in general just flow to another CFT? What happens to all of these expressions? Uh, you may ask similar questions. Well, I can also turn on boundary perturbations on the disks. What does that mean um, for entanglement? And um, then you can look at these so-called symmetry protected topological phases in more detail or look at excited states, for instance. Um, instead of taking, like, I only talked about the vacuum, right? So what happens if you take some other states for the system? All right, that's what I have to say. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, please. So I remember there is this proposal by Rangamani and company about the covariant uh, version. Because here you do everything, uh, your cut in uh, it's only space like. Yeah. Is the, is, the, is the conventional end of yeah. the time entropy. There is this event, um, so their proposal is to have a, a covariant version which would have eventually even cut in the space, space like, uh, or space time cut. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, is there any, I mean, because you're talking about the CFT in principle, and uh, uh, have you thought about eventually to have some, uh, let's say, boundary, temporal boundary, or uh, well, anything I that can about happen? That. Uh, um, yeah. I haven't thought about that. So one thing I should say is like this has all been Euclidean CFT. Right. Um, so I would have to think, I mean, wick rotating back and imposing boundaries certainly comes with subtleties if I want to do this at the time. Yeah. Um, I would have to think about what that means, <laughs> like physically. What okay. Would that mean? okay. No, but basically, you're right. You're saying that it's thermal. So basically, it's uh, the final temperature. I've never seen the beta here. So do you have an example? Yeah, that's it's in Q, sorry, I, I was Q, but yeah. the, the Kardec calibrations can be generated at finite temperature. Right? Yeah, right. So if there is that's an actual big. right, right. Yeah. Um, actually, yes. So in this 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 uh, 
this Q. Yeah. Uh, that was not the question. No, no, sure, sure. Uh, Q Q is um, Q is a function of W. Uh, something like two pi one over W, uh, something like that. And the point is that if you start, like I started with with a vacuum, uh, and then you had something like two logarithm of a divided by epsilon. So this is a vacuum. But if you pick a thermal state to begin with, you can actually also do this for a single interval. Uh, let's give this some temperature beta. Then I may, I'm, I may, I may not get the factors right, but in principle, this is going to be logarithm of hyperbolic sine uh, a over the temperature, and then I think temperature over epsilon, yeah, something like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you see that that this width uh, is going to first of all it reduces to that, um, and this width now codes the, the temperature. And if you put the boundary now, you would get also this. Uh, yeah. Then up, uh, the would be up like. Yeah, you would also get that 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 piece that that piece goes um, is independent of Q. Yeah. It so it shows up for whenever the, the the trick is the following. So the, you if you can end up if you can map. So there was this annulus. If you have some state and you pick, for instance, um, let's pick a state which lives on the cylinder, you can map this, like this, this subregion here. This thing can be mapped into here. Whenever you can do that, whenever you can find an F that, that does that for you, independent of the, like, of the starting configuration, whenever you can map it to here, you're good. Really? This is how you see that for two intervals, this doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Unfortunately, it, it would be desirable to have something like that because the idea of, uh, first of all, the idea of putting these boundaries is just natural for Q of T. Uh, it's independent of one interval, it's independent of C of T, it's just a field theory argument. So I, I personally expect this to be reasonable. Um, but uh, we don't know. We don't know. Like, even if I, if I took now two intervals, I don't know what how to work with that. Um, so that's one problem. And um, and now I have one more comment to say. Forgot now. It started. You started out with the beginning of the money pack. No, it's like, more. Yeah, I was thinking more about the time. Uh, uh, yeah. Time slice. Uh, I mean, in the literature uh, I have seen this, but uh, never seen it as a boundary. The calculation of the boundary. Uh, Right. No, they, 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 they seem. I'm, sh I'm sure it's like NIT friends are aware of yeah. these constructions because the Cardi, Cardi started working on it. So right. I would be surprised if he didn't. Uh, it's just that I guess for now he, he just carry on. The, I should check. One more comment I should say though. I mean, um, entanglement is a priori. You want the factorization for entanglement, and it need not be a spatial. Factorization. Oh, exactly. That's so, for instance, if you went venture away from spatial factorizations, I don't think you require boundary conditions. Like, suppose you're interested in, the, so you have from the CFT of left movers and right movers. If you can factorize Hilbert space into left and right, then you're good. You don't need to impose any boundary conditions. Right. So the boundary conditions really comes from the fact that I'm dealing with the field theory, and I need to tell my fields how to behave in space. When when, when I'm making a space or spatial factorization. Yeah. That's it. Um. Yeah, I think just to get the structure clear in my head, can, I think you you mentioned the Isaac and Donald field theory. Yeah. There, just in. And the difference is, yes. some boundary conditions that you're allowing here, alpha and beta go to one through the three primaries. Is that right? Uh, which two primaries? Sorry. Three primaries. You've got yeah, 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 right, right, right. Right. Actually, it, it, so this is this is one of the papers by by Tachikawa and Nomoni. They um, right, first there was the observation by Leuchy simulations just for a Bosa-Hubbard chain, and then it looks like uh, the obvious question: is What did that look like from the from just the Isaac case? Right. Um, um, so the, tra the transverse Isaac. Right. So what they I think that's exactly what they did. Right. They they what they did is exactly they took the Ising model and added them in their queue. Uh, they just uh, 
using, and you add a magnetic field, something like that. Uh, and then, and then uh, they, 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 have, they have a chain, they picked some sub-region, sorry, um, this is probably the transverse easing. Yeah. But the magnetic field, you mean the yeah, field yeah, yeah, yeah. The transverse field? Okay. Right, 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 right. Tran transverse field. Yeah, that's fine, okay. Um, and then they fooled around. Like, first, first of all, like, let me make one, one general statement that this, this symposium of boundary conditions works for field theory. Like, suppose I only had a state with um, like this one, two, three, four, five, six sites, yes. right? If I impose boundary conditions here and here, this will drastically change the state, right? So it will. Um, Yes, it will. You, you will should, drastically. You should, so it's natural to treat with periodic only conditions. Right. It's simple there. Right, because exactly. So so here, uh, like this, the, the state will just change. If I have many, 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 many spins, like I assume with a many continuum, then well, fixing. I, mean, I don't think you need to discuss the boundary conditions there because you need it to be conformal and adding a adding a boundary there is just going to confuse things. This transverse easing is going to be the isocritical critical class, and when you tune your uh, couplings to the uh, self dual point, you will hit the grid. You'll be the yeah, 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 you'll do that. That's that's mm -hmm. true. But but when you fix the sub region, yes. you still you still have a freedom implicitly. People have always been doing this, but like if you do a simulation, you have the freedom to fix this. You have you have the freedom to fix it or not or leave it free. Like people have been leaving it free, but implicitly this is also a boundary condition in the CFT. Like you. you at the free boundary condition. You can do that, yes. Right. And then the point is that you have um, in the CFT there are three primaries, three conformal boundary conditions. And fixing this spin up or down or leaving it free is going to correspond to some boundary condition in the CFT. Yes. Right. So that's how you that's how you go about it. The paper by by Omori Tachikawa, this is a lengthy calculation. They they show that um, you can you can have this here fixed up, this year fixed down, or you can leave it free, what do we draw, draw free, and fix this one. They, they look at various combinations, and they do map it into, so they do the lattice calculation. Yes, map it so the lattice calculation, and I mean, you can easily confuse, you can yeah. almost do it by hand what the, what, the, uh, uh, what this uh, Rene entropy is for the, this transverse easing on a relatively long chain. Yeah. Uh, That's what they did. And yeah, now yeah. you can look at the eigenvalues of that density matrix. Right. In, and you presumably again see that parabola. Also, Not necessarily. The, 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 the easing doesn't have a parabola, but you, you will see the, the spectrum of the easing, like the, the representations, the modules, yeah. those will appear. So what do you see in that case? You just see. Uh, well, just the descendants, right? So the, now the. The Fox spaces are just the L minus one. So say you have um, what do we call this? Phi and phi can be yeah, the three, one, of the three, three, yeah. one of these three, right? And then you you build up Fox spaces. Yes, but I'm looking at the numerical data. What do you see? Oh, I they, they didn't do the numerics. They they just they did it analytically. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, I find it. I find it's it is not the same. That, that, that's not the lattice coming because you can do it exactly. Yeah. Right, right. They they take this. So they write down they write down the density matrices for these guys for the reduced density. So they they do that. They evaluate their any entropy. They show. Uh, they, 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 you think they do it analytically for? Uh, for the, the okay, maybe maybe I should, I should check what exactly they do. But in my mind, they they do they do compute. For for some from some data sizes, they do compute the range entries, and then they show that um, that it basically boils down to characters yes. of Verizon or all of the easing model, and then what what remains to show that you've picked under conditions here, and they reduced the CFT uh, partition functions expected by card. And, and you get it, and, you, and, and now you, but you really, you can get an exact formula for what this uh, this Rene entropy is. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's this one here. Um, oh. Where is it? Oh, I can write it down. So, um, okay, so it's, it's this one where you replace the characters for some value by the partition function. You, you get 
and this is for sitting at the critical point and sufficiently large lattices and sufficiently yep. large right. you can even cover that. And you get a set in S alpha beta tau. Right. You get that. Um, they didn't get that. They took the completing order. Um, excuse me, no, no, they, they, they looked at. Let me get my facts. Um, you get that. You, you should get that just just by some considerations. But let me let me what exactly is that they compute, um, and I'll come back to you. Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's nice but, to know how exact how accurate. Yeah, no principle. I think um, it's very accurate, at least formal. The the problem, the problem is also like simulations and stuff. It will come from like various effects. You have all those on, under control as well. Uh, There's no reason you have this. Well, from a CFT perspective, <laughs> from, the, from, the, from the original model. Yeah, yeah. From the original, you you have your control. It's an old. But, but I guess also that in this symmetry solver that we have here, if I'm not in the CFT regime, still I get a topological bar. Right? So the topological is, because it has been calculated already now for, um, I mean, this topological boundary part uh, should be there even if you lose uh, the conformal invariant. So, yeah. Right, now the question, the question is a little bit what is this model? Um, so I, I agree that the term. Um, should appear uh, now if, for instance, GitHub Pascal, they looked at a double insulator. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so that's T that you have the edge, the chiral, and I impose conformal boundary conditions, which incompatible with their reality. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So the, the central charges, um, the central charges must degree here, uh, T. Right. right. So, yeah. well, one zero. Yeah, so, yeah. so you can't really have a whole binary. I expect that that there has to be some analogous way of getting around it. Uh, because precisely that reason is it just shows up on the nose. Would be too too much of a coincidence. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think there has to be a way of what I can extract in, in a. Okay. Yeah, I think we'd be very close to what we had in the seminar ah. two weeks ago. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, uh, yeah. Yes, the, uh, that family of systems is, is yeah. analyzable in this way. Absolutely. absolutely. Which, which had the limit of the one model in there uh, as well. Just uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, extracting yeah. it from a different point of view. Oh, it was that. There was a seminar we had two weeks ago by um, uh, um, Stagger Bosons, I think it was. Yeah, it was um, by uh, David Bernstein. Okay. Uh, it's an it, it, it falls into the problem of that uh, of these non invertible symmetries. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested in that. Staggered goes on some of the symmetries. Yeah, I'm wondering if um, I mean that topological term that, that uh, Jan was focusing on should be the object that that crops up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, take a roll there. Right, right. Um, maybe we can stop with another. Yes, question. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We thank you again. Uh, thank you.